Okay, let's jump into the second lecture. So right now we're about like an hour south of Reno in this town called Mason. Um, we're kind of holding up this dude's house from we know from like the old days. Like he used to roll. He's like a huge Dino Bravo fan. He used to roll JL in, in Seattle uh, on the streets, you know, rough up. So we were just kind of out here anyway. So we needed a place to go chill for a bit and kind of wait till things cool down. So we're out here and he's kind of let me record the lecture here in this weird like shed thing he has on the side of his house. So um, so for today, what we're going to talk about is is sort of get into now talking about transactions. So I want to first sort of talk about some background material about to sort of set the stage from what we're going to talk about throughout the, the semester. Um, and then we'll jump into the materials talking about transaction models, contingent protocols, and isolation levels. So the as I said in the, in the first day of, of, of the first lecture, um, this course is a, all about building modern data management systems. So we're focused on how to build systems for, for today's OOTP or transaction processing workloads and uh, analytical workloads. And so the way to sort of think about where we're going in, in the course material is that the, the first three weeks are going to be focused on transaction processing. So for in-memory databases, how can we execute transactions efficiently and ingest new data quickly? And then the idea then going forward after that is that we're going to focus primarily on how to do analytical operations or execute complex queries on the data that we've collected from our uh, from our transactions and transactions transaction processing workload. Um, and then we want to derive new information that can then inform whatever decisions our organization have to make have to make. So the way to think about this is like we're we're going to focus on how to execute transactions, how to collect data quickly. You know, whether it's coming from a website or whether it's coming from IoT sensors, or we want to see how can we get new data into our database quickly. And then what we want to be able to do is then, if we collect a lot of data, then can we, how do we execute queries that have to do joins, aggregations, and other things, do that efficiently as fast as possible. So the typical way that people think about database workloads is usually along the lines of these two primary categories I'm showing at the top here. So OLTP and OLAP. So online transaction processing workloads are that first part I talked about where you're ingesting information. So this is where the application wants to execute uh, operations very quickly that are going to read and update the database and the, in the context of a transaction. But the idea here, here is that the amount of data that they're going to operate on per transaction is actually quite small. So the, the classic example that I always like to use is to understand this is, is something like Amazon. So with Amazon, you, you go to the website, you add things to your shopping cart, you make purchases, maybe update your address information, right? All of those, those operations that I'm describing, those are transactions that are only going to operate on just your data, right? So you, you can only go to the website and update your account. You can only update your payment information. So each of those transactions are only touching the small number of tuples for just to update your information. Now contrast this with OLAP workloads or online analytical processing workloads. These are where the, the queries are concerned about looking at the total data or large segments of the data. So rather than looking at you know, just your account information, they want to look at multiple people's account information and derive new information or, or identify different patterns to allow them to make better decisions in their organization. So this is typically doing complex queries with joins that maybe compute some kind of aggregation. So again, in OLTP, we go to the website and we update just our account information. With OLAP, we want to look at maybe everyone's account information that in you know in in the month of January in you know in the zip code one five two one seven that bought blue shirts or something, right? So you're looking at large segments of the of the table and you want to compute new information. So again, typically this is how people think about database systems. Um, and this is typically how they're, they're marketed or sold. The change we've seen in the last five, six, seven years is that we've sort of seen a, a new category of database systems called HTAP, or Hybrid Transaction Analytical Processing Workloads. And the idea is that we want to be able to process both OTP workloads and OLAP workloads inside the same database instance right, without having maybe uh, separate bifurcation or separate machines in a bifurcated environment. So to explain what I mean by that, like a bifurcated environment, let's look at an example. So this is actually a pretty typical uh, 
database system setup that, that you see in a lot of applications. So you have your sort of front end side, your, your old to be data silos, and this is where you're going to execute your transactions that are, that's going to ingest new information. So the, the, the reason why they're called silos is that the transactions are really operating on just one database at a time. Like they're not going across, across machines, across database instances. It's really focused on like for my database instance, I do my transaction on just on the data inside of it. So now you want to do analytics on this data you've collected across all your silos. But you don't want to typically, you know, or traditionally, you don't want to do this on the actual data silo, the O2B side itself, because that's going to slow down your transactions. And that's a bad idea because this, again, this is where you're, you're ingesting information because you're placing orders, you're making stock trades, you're doing some kind of financial updates, right? You don't want to slow this down because this is sort of the core part, uh, the core business logic or the, the purpose of, 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 the, of the organization. So what people do is they use what is called ETL, extract, transform, and load. These, these are frameworks that, that specialize in getting data out of these front-end o 2 data silos do some kind of cleaning or transformation to put it into a sort of standardized form across all your silos, and then you're going to load it into your database. So again, the way to think about what's going on here is, say we have a bunch of O2B silos where one database calls the field for someone's first name as first name, first underscore name, and then another database silo calls it F name. So in the transformation process, we would then know how to, to fix the schema so it's, it's standardized across all, all our uh, database instances. So this obviously takes time because you're copying data out of one database, putting it into a, some kind of bus or, or, or message patching construct or framework to then shove it back to your data warehouse. So this takes time. And it's expensive if you're, in, if you're loading a lot of data. So then we load all this data out of the ETL framework or toolkit into our analytical data warehouse and this is where we're going to run our, our analytical queries. So these are our complex joins, our aggregations to extract new information from the data we've collected from the old piece side. And in some applications, you actually end up pushing updates from the back end data warehouse to the front end OTP systems um, to allow them to modify their behavior. Right? So think of something like uh, you know, Amazon wants to figure out what items to show you to make you buy them. So you collect all the data from the OTP side of what people have bought. You shove them through into your data warehouse. You compute some complex analytic program to figure out well, people that bought this bought that, and then you make you send an update to the, data, the database in the front end so that the next time the user comes back, you show them uh, you show them you know certain products you think they're going to buy. So what people want is they want to cut down the time it takes to to collect this data from the OTB side and then produce actionable information on the analytical side as much as possible. So this is sort of where the HTAP fits in. So we're going to be able to run the same types of analytical queries that we typically could only run on the data warehouse, but now we're going to run them on, on our front end transaction processing database. So you're not going to run all your, your queries, right? certainly uh, you know, very complex things may not be suitable for running the front end because that's going to slow down your, your system. Um, but the idea here is that things that could only be done in the back end, now we can do in the front end. So we cut down that time it takes to transfer the data through the ETL pipeline into the data warehouse and pushing it back. We can just do, it, do our analytical operations directly on the front end. The other thing to point out here too is the, the ETL process doesn't go away, right? Because we still have these data silos in the front end where they're not talking to each other. So we still need that to put it back into our data warehouse. And certainly if we're talking about in-memory databases, we don't want to store you know, maybe all our data in the front end because that would be expensive. So ETLs doesn't go away. It's just things that we can only do in the back end, we, we can now push to the front end. Another way to characterize this, this dichotomy or the distinction between these different workload categories is through this nice uh, sort of Venn diagram uh, chart that Mike Sternbreaker uh, came up in a publication a few years ago. And so along the Y axis, he's uh, remarking on whether the, the, the types of queries that these workloads are going to support are either simple or complex. And then on the x-axis, it's whether the workload is focused on doing a lot of writes or doing a lot of reads. So you see at the two extremes, you have the OTP uh, workloads down in one corner where the, the operations are quite simple, but you're not doing crazy 10-way or 20-way or, or, you know, joins. It's just doing joins and foreign keys, looking up a small amount of data. 
and you're doing a lot of writes because you're making updates based on how the outside world is in interacting with your application or your database. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the OLAP workloads where it's mostly refocused because, again, you're computing, you're looking at all the data you collected from the OTP side, and the types of queries you're doing are typically more complex. Again, the HTAP stuff is sort of uh, meant to straddle in the middle, where you're sort of doing, doing a little bit from, from, from OTP side and a little bit from the OLAP side, right? So that's the way to sort of think about what uh, we'll be talking about through the entire semester. And part of the reason why I'm starting off with us talking about transactions is because if we want to be able to support HTAP workloads, then as we talk about all the analytical OLAP stuff throughout the course, in the back of our minds, we need to be thinking about, well, how would I actually apply this in a system where we're still executing transactions and I don't want to slow those transactions down, right? How do I make sure I'm not stealing resources or scheduling things that I need for my transactional workloads uh, when I want to execute analytical workloads. So that in the back of your mind throughout everything we look at or talk about throughout the entire semester, you should be thinking about, all right, how would I actually do this when I'm at, you know, this technique or build this kind of type of internal component when I know I need to execute transactions as well. All right, so that's, again, that's sort of the background of where we're going for the next three weeks and why we're focusing on transactions first. But the protocol and the, the methodology we're gonna focus on is called multi-version compared control. Um, and we're primarily gonna talk about that. That is actually a commercial protocol or implementation method that supports HTAP workloads quite, quite well. And we'll see why as we go in more detail next class. All right, so now let's talk about transactions. Um, so again, the background material you should already have about what transactions are. I just want to go through a little bit at a high level uh, what I mean when I say transactions and what how this is going to fit into what we're talking about throughout the semester. Um, but everything, again, this, this should all should be review for, for everyone here. So a transaction is just a sequence of actions that are being executed in a shared database to perform some higher level function. So by higher level, I mean not a, you know, a write to a single record. I mean something that's at the application level, right? So again, using that Amazon example, adding something to your shopping cart, you know, updating, uh, you know, your, your, your state for your shopping cart and what items are in it. That's a higher level function that can be invoked as part of a transaction. So transactions are going to be the basic unit change in the database. And what that essentially means is that all operations will be done in the context of transactions and the database system cannot allow any partial transactions, right? And that, that's the sort of fundamental guarantee of, of what a you know, transaction processing data system will, will do for us. Whereas in, if you use like a NoSQL system that doesn't support multi-operation transactions or multi-document or multi-record transactions, that logic you have to write yourself in your application and you're probably going to get it wrong so you don't want to do this so it's ideally the data system can provide this for you so now we can talk about what these actions actually are and the, the, the i like to use this category here because again it sort of focuses on what is something that's a fundamental thing that the database system is going to provide and what's something that the underlying system that it's running on will do for us and we can build on top of them so we have unprotected actions, protected actions, and real actions. So unprotected actions are, again, the, the basic primitives of what a computer provides for us. And they're not going to have all the asset guarantees that we're going to want for our, for our regular transactions, the higher level transactions, but we can use them in, in clever ways or, or redundant ways that allow us to achieve what we want in our protected actions. So one way, to, one sort of obvious example to think about this is writing to a disk. So most uh, most disk drives or SSDs will only allow you to do atomic four kilobyte writes. So if I need to write, say, twelve kilobytes, which would be uh, uh, three four kilobyte pages, then the, the the drive itself cannot guarantee that all three writes will be atomic. It can only guarantee that's one of them. Right, so that's that's what we mean by an unprotected action. So now protected action is something that will be built on top of unprotected actions that is going to allow us, again, provide that full asset guarantees that we want for our transactions, right? So the way to think about this is we can use the unprotected actions 
to do uh, unprotected, you know, to do one four kilobyte writes to the disk, but then we can maybe write to a log and write to our, to our, our table heap as well and flush those out. And the combination of the two of them will be enough to guarantee that uh, our transaction is, is, is fully acid. The last category is called real actions. If these are not what we're going to focus on throughout the semester. These are things that modify or affect the real world, the physical world, in ways that the database system has no control over. So it's, it's, it's basically impossible to be able to undo changes that, are, that may occur in, these, in the real world. So the example I always like to give is say we have a uh, order processing application and we execute our transaction and we're updating payment information and then halfway through the transaction, we send an order confirmation email to the user to say, yes, we, we process your order. But then we keep, for whatever reason, the application is written poorly, we keep executing more queries after we send that email and those queries end up failing, whether there's a conflict or some other problem. And now we need to abort that transaction. But the problem is we sent that email out to, to the customer, and that's actually now out in the physical world. And we, we can't control that. We can't undo or, or retract that email. Right, so these are the kind of things that, that uh, or what I mean by a real action, and these are not something the data system has any control over. So these aren't things that we're actually going to care about. All right, so now with this, now we can actually talk about how do we use unprotected actions to build protected actions and support different types of transactions. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different transaction models that you can have, a database system can provide. Um, I would say sort of a spoiler is going to be the flat transactions and the flat transactions or save points are probably the really the one of the most common types of transactions uh, that are used in, in the real world. Um, and they're probably the only ones that actually, they are the only ones we're going to focus on throughout the semester. But I still think it's useful to think about other types of transaction models that people can have in using their application that go beyond sort of the classic textbook definition of transactions that we talk about in an in introduction class. So the first type of model we're talking about is flat transactions. So flat transactions are sort of what everyone thinks of when they think of a transaction. Like this is the standard approach that everyone uses, right? You have a begin statement followed by one or more actions, and then the transaction finishes when there's either a commit or a rollback statement. Or also the, the data system could also abort your transaction uh, if there's a conflict, right? But for that one, we, we can ignore for now. So in this case here, transaction one does begin, there's a read on A, write on B, then commits. And at the commit point, when we notify the outside world that our transaction has successfully committed, then we know that our right to be is durable. Any transaction that comes after us will be able to see it. Uh, and if the system crashes, we'll be guaranteed that, um, that our, our changes are, are still there when we come back online. In the case of transaction two, there's a read on A, write on B, then it rolls back. And then what's happened at that point is any transaction that comes afterwards, no matter how many times we crash, they should not see the right to be. So again, flat transactions are what pe most people think about when they think about transactions. When you read any kind of tutorial online about how you do transactions and they talk about begins and commits, it's essentially, without calling it flat transactions, they are the flat transaction model. And I can't prove this, but I would say probably 99% of all the transactions executed in, in today's software in the world is, is running flat transactions. All right, so what are some of the problems with this? Well, the first problem with flat transactions is that the there's no way to do any partial rollbacks, right? So when I call rollback in my transaction, I have to roll back all my changes, right? So so if, say I, I need to update 100 tuples, I update 99 to them, and then in the 100th one, I recognize I, I need to roll that, that my change back. I got to roll back everything. I just can't roll back just the last one I did. So sort of related to this is that if the system crashes before my transaction completes, then I lose all my changes. Right? Again, this is what we said in the beginning. The basic unit change of in a database system will be, will be a transaction. So there's no partial transaction. So this is not a surprise that this is going to happen. But it kind of sucks when you think about really large updates to a database system. Right? This is going to be expensive if you have to keep redoing the same work over and over again. And the last one's a bit nuanced. Uh, 
it's debatable whether this is an issue. It depends on what your application wants. But the uh, every transaction under the flat transaction model has to take place in a single point in time. Right? You can't sort of stop and come back uh, at a later date. It always has to be sort of all or nothing at, at the very beginning. So this is sort of abstract, right? Maybe it's hard to understand why this, this may be problematic. So let's actually look at some real, some real examples. So the first example of, of a deficiency with flat transactions are when you want to do what is called multi-stage planning. So think of like you're, you're like a travel agent uh, and somebody wants to book a flight from, from Pittsburgh to, to Florence. Well, you can't fly directly from Pittsburgh to Florence. So say you want to go, you had to book a flight from Pittsburgh to JFK, from JFK to Rome. And then maybe instead of taking the uh, plane up to Florence, you take the train. So each of those tickets I have to get is, is, is one stage. And I want to make sure that I get all of my tickets that I need rather than, than, than some of them, right? If I can't get the, 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 the plane ticket from, uh, or sorry, if I can't get the train ticket from, from Rome to Florence, then, then who cares that I could be able to fly to Rome? That's not where I wanted to go. So in the flat transaction model, you can't do that, you know, automatically or natively inside the database system because it can't do these, these partial rollbacks uh, for your transactions. You can't have these multi-stage operations. It's going to be all or nothing. And therefore, to be able to support something like this, you have to write additional application logic to make it happen. The other problem uh, example we can talk about is doing bulk updates. So I think I talked about this a little bit, but say I need to update 100 tuples. I update 99 of them, but then on the last one, uh, uh, there's some kind of failure or there's a conflict, and now I need to roll back all my changes. So this may seem kind of simple. You may be thinking, oh, with 100 tuples, who cares? But you know, now think about 1 billion tuples. Think about an operation where I need to update at a bank all my customers' uh, accounts with something. So it's, I have 1 billion customers. It's, it's going to take me hours to complete. And during this time, uh, I could have a conflict or the system could crash and therefore all the work that I did will just get rolled back when the system comes back online or when I import my transaction. And therefore I'm just doing a bunch of, of work that's essentially wasted and I may never actually even be able to complete my operation because there's always going to be a conflict. So the transaction models we're going to talk about next are don't always aren't completely except for one of them completely remedy these problems but we can see how we sort of chip away and look at more sophisticated uh, or complex transaction models to be able to handle these, these various types of problems. So the first model we can talk about are what are called transaction save points. So as I said, these are probably the, the second most common types of transactions you see in the real world uh, after flat transactions. And the idea of a, of a save point is that we're going to save the, the, the current state of the transaction um, at, at the moment you ask to, to create the save point, and then that provides us now a handle that we can then refer to it later on to tell us whether we want to roll back any changes at that save point or also just you know delete any metadata we've maintained about it. So this is all within the SQL standard, so I can create a save point with a save point operation, uh, and then I assign it a handle, and then with the rollback, I revert any changes going back to the, that particular save point I want to roll back to. And then with, with release, I destroy that save point just to free up some metadata. Um, so what I'll say is that for uh, the way this is actually going to be implemented in various database systems depends on, you know, depends on implementation. Um, logically, the semantics are all defined in the SQL standards. They should be the same. Um, how it's actually impl implemented under the covers can, can vary. So you know, one system I'm familiar with is Postgres. So when you do a rollback in Postgres, what happens is it ends up actually aborting all your, the subtransactions um, up to the one you identify the rollback to, and then it recreates the subtransaction state. So it's almost like it's like creating a new subtransaction after you do a rollback. Other systems uh, just revert all the, the changes and, and resume the, the, the save point you, you come back to. Um, in the case of release, uh, this is almost like a like a, a logical operation. As far as I know, there's you don't actually physically destroy the save point uh, because this is required now to copy things maybe in the read write set or the internal transaction state at that that at that save point into another save point or the or the implicit one. 
and this is just sort of unnecessary work. You just make it so that you can't actually access this this, this save point after you release it. Uh, the one area that actually save points actually come up really are really common is that you can use them in user defined functions or UD apps to support ex exception handling because again it allows you to just go back to the last save point right before you entered a, a try block or before you started the UDF. So they're very common. Be uh, save points are very common in in, in systems that support user defined functions. So let's look at an example. We have a simple transaction here. Let's do a write on a, a B, write on a, write on B, and write on C. So the, so when our transaction starts, we call begin, and this is going to create an implicit save point. So the save point's not going to ha have a handle. It's not going to have a name, but it's going to be created as part of this when this transaction starts. So now when we do a write on A, that's going to land in in our save point here. So we don't care about the values. We're just saying you know, the object A has been written into the save point. So now we're going to invoke the save point command, which is going to change our implicit save point that was created when our transaction started, and is going to give it a handle. So in this case here, we're going to say it's save point number one. And then this is now going to create our new implicit save point where all our new writes will end up going into. So once we create the save point, give it a handle, then we don't update any of the transaction rewrite set in, within that save point. It always goes to the new one. So now we come back to maybe this command here and do a rollback on one. What's going to happen is we're going to blow away any modifications that we have outstanding in our save point. Um, and we're going to essentially revert the database back to the state it was at save point one. So now uh, we create a new save point, the implicit one, and now any writes go to that. And then when we commit, we see the changes uh, that we made from A to C. We don't see the, the change we made to B. So let's look at another, another more complicated example. So our transaction starts, and this transaction wants to do a write on A, B, C, and D. So again, when it begins, we create our implicit save point. Um, and then when we do our write, that gets, gets put into that implicit save point. We invoke the save point command. That gives us a handle for the first one, creates a new one. We do a write on B. That goes into our implicit one. Um, and then we do a create a save point two. So now what's going to happen here is that because we're going to have now multiple instantiated save points, not in, in addition to the sort of implicit one, it's going to link the second save point with the first one together. So it knows that the save point one is the parent to save point two. So what's going to happen is if we end up blowing away save point one, that will implicitly, sorry, if, if we end up rolling back to save point one, or that's going to you know, revert any changes that are in save point two. Likewise, if we release save point one, that'll automatically release save point two as well. And again, those changes will still stick around, it's just we can't access it anymore through its handle. So again, now we, so, so we do a write on C, same thing. When we create a new save point, save point three is now linked to save point two. But now here we're going to do our release on two. So this is going to, again, blow away the internal metadata we're maintaining about knowing that save point two exists although the changes are still there, but now we can't roll back to it. And then implicitly, because save point three is linked to save point two, save point three gets blown away as well. Now we do our write on D, that ends, lands in our implicit save point, and then now we try to roll back to three, but again, we're not gonna be able to do this because we release save point two, which implicitly released or cascaded that release to save point three, so therefore, we can't complete this operation, and the transaction is going to get aborted, and all the changes will get rolled back. All right, so a, uh, one way to think about save points is that they are a, a sequence of actions that can then be rolled back individually based on the save point handle. Another variant of this is called nested transactions, where you can actually have a hierarchy of actions or operations you're doing within the transaction. So the way to think about it is you have sub-transactions within your transaction. And the sub-transactions, the final outcome of these sub-transactions or the child transactions depend on the output, the outcome of the parent transaction, all the way up to the beginning of, of the tree. So I would say that my understanding is that semantically, save points and uh, nested transactions are, are equivalent, and you can implement uh, nested transactions with save points if you want. Um, 
It's almost like they're, they're just sort of syntactical, syntactic sugar. So let's look at the table of a nested transaction. So again, the way to think about this is that inside of our transaction, we're going to have all these nested begin and commits, but the final outcome depends on, on for, the, for the topmost begin, will depend on the, 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 the last commit that corresponds to it. So let's say our transaction starts, we do a begin, and again, underneath the covers, we could be maintaining save points. It doesn't matter, right? For our purposes here, we just want to see sort of at a logical level what's happening. So we first do a write on A. That's fine, with it, but that's within our transaction. But then we see this begin statement here. So what that's going to do is it's going to invoke a sub-transaction, 1.1, where now all of the operations between that begin and before the, the, the final commit are then going to be executed within the context of the sub-transaction. And so typically you don't know all the operations you're doing ahead of time. I'm just showing them moving, moving over as a way to, to visualize this. Um, but you know, it's, it's, you don't actually know where the last, you know, the last commit or the last rollback is in, in most cases. And this is just for illustration purposes. So now I do my write on B. Now that write on B is in the context of the sub transaction 1.1. I see another begin that fires off another subtransaction 1.1.1, and again all my operations that within within the beginning commit clause get get executed over here. Now I do a write on C. I go ahead and commit, and all the changes from 1.1.1 are uh, are saved, but now they're sort of put into the context of 1.1, right? But I I'm not. So in, in subtransaction 1.1, I can see the change I made to object C, um, but technically it has the, the sub subtransaction has not committed yet because I need to see whether 1.1 commits. So now I do my write on D, but now I hit this rollback command. So what this rollback command is going to do is going to blow away all the operations or modifications made by my transaction 1.1. So that's the write on B and the write on D. But it's also going to blow away the modification made on C by subtransaction 1.1.1, right? Because again, the sub subtransaction, its final outcome depends on its parent transaction, and its parent transaction is doing a rollback, so that rolls back everything that it did. So now our our execution context comes back to our uh, our parent transaction, the, the 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 topmost transaction. It does a commit, and then that only applies the change to A. Right. The modifications, the B, C, and D, uh, don't get persisted, don't get actually uh, stored because they got rolled back in the, in, the, in the nested transaction. So again, uh, not all systems support save points, not all systems support nested transactions. Um, at least as of MySQL 5.7, they supported nested transaction. Or sorry, yeah, they support nested transaction. Postgres doesn't actually support uh, nested transactions. Different data systems have different things. And again, semantically, they're essentially the same thing. All right, so now we can talk about a, another variant of a transaction model called transaction chains. And in the case of save points, in the case of, 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 of nested transactions, it, at the end of the day, it, it is essentially one transaction, right? So when you, when you commit, that determines at the very end whether any of the operations or modifications you, you made in your subtransactions or your save points, right? That determines whether you apply any changes. With transaction chains, the idea is that we're going to execute multiple transactions one after another. And what will happen is the commit of one transaction and the begin of the next transaction in the chain will be atomic meaning that no other transaction is allowed to, to change the database state that will be viewed by the second transaction uh, after the first transaction commits. So I'll, we'll show an example of this in, in a second, but the, the way to think about this is that the other transactions could be mod that aren't part of the chain could be modifying the database on different objects. That's fine, but as long as they don't modify anything that... Uh, could be read or or that was either read by the, the, the first transaction in the chain or the second transaction chain or written by the first transaction and read by the second. As long as they modify any, anything in between the switch from one transaction to the next in the chain, then, then we're fine. So now this sounds like save points, but again, the key difference is that the, the 
each transaction or subtransaction, if you want to call that, within the chain is its own standalone transaction. And that means you're not going to be able to roll back any previous transactions you successfully executed in the chain um, within the database system. Like a calls commit, things get flushed to disk, you send acknowledgement back to the application server, and it's done. You can't roll that back. The other difference, you know, from a from an implementation standpoint, is that the since since each transaction in the chain is its own uh, is its own sort of first class transaction, this allows the data system to decide whether to release all the locks for the first trans, you know for the for the committing transaction and and before it starts the second one, or whether it can actually hand off the locks if you know you're operating on the same thing. Right, depends on the implementation. Different systems do different things, but in general, you can think about it as like you could just release all the locks and then require them in the second transaction. But logically, as long as no one modifies anything we should be reading in the second transaction, then we're fine. Let's look at an example. So we have a three transaction chain, uh, T1, T2, T3. So we start with T1, and it's going to do a write on A, and this little image at the bottom, it's showing us where we're actually, you know, just what, what, what modifications we're making to the database and whether they're going to be persisted or not. So now when transaction one calls, gets to this point here, it calls commit. But again, it's a full-fledged transaction. It has to flush all the changes out the disk uh, before we hand it off to the second transaction. Um, that's actually not entirely true. Like you could speculate execute the second transaction, but the way to think about it is can, because it's, it's a first-class transaction, we can't tell the outside world that transaction one has committed uh, until we know everything's been safely written to disk. We could start running transaction two, assuming transaction one is going to complete, and just make sure that we don't commit transaction two unless one commits. So now this one here, let's just keep it simple. T1 fl flushes their, the log out the disk. So now we can then start executing transaction two. And this transaction wants to do a read on A, write on B. So this is the key part I was trying to say in the last slide that no other transaction is allowed to modify the, the state of the database in a way that could be observed by transaction two in between the, the, the completion of t, uh, transaction one and the startup of transaction two. Again, think about like if I have to flush out, flush my T1's log records out the disk and some other thread could start pick up another transaction, start running in between before, before I start executing transaction two. And as long as that transaction doesn't modify anything that will be read by T2, then that's okay. So long as, in this case here, as long as no one modifies uh, object A and overwrites the change that T1 did, then that's fine in my transaction chain. So again, I do my read on A, do my write on B, then I commit. Again, the, this fires off now transaction three in my chain and I could you know, flush the change to B uh, before I start that up. Again, it depends on the implementation. So now I start executing transaction three. I'm gonna write on C, but now I'm gonna do a rollback. And so the final outcome of this transaction chain will be that we will persist the changes to A and B, but we'll have to roll back the change to C. Again, under transaction chains, each transaction in the chain is its own first class transaction. So therefore, no matter what happens later down the chain, as long as I get through the commit phase of my transaction, my changes will be persisted here. So this solves the multi-stage planning problem in some ways, um, but it, it doesn't solve the, the bulk update problem, right? It sort of seems like this is what we want to do, um, but it doesn't go all the way there because it requires us to write additional application logic to be able to handle the fares, failures and rollback state. So what I mean by that is in the case of, if I want to do the bulk update where it's sort of all or nothing for one billion tuples, I can do that as a train chain transaction and that may improve the amount of parallelism that I have in my system. But the issue is going to be that the, if a transaction, you know, the very last tuple that, that gets updated by the last transaction, if there's a conflict there and I have to roll back, I can't roll back all the, the previous transactions because I'm under the chain transaction model. Each one is committed on its own. So the, this requires us to write additional logic and application to figure out what's the right thing to do. Um, and then make sure that we invoke that operation to reverse those changes, uh, as needed, which now means we need to keep track of where, what transactions we've invoked to reverse things, which is now we're maintaining sort of the same, uh, 
transaction uh, table and other information that a data system would normally provide for us. So what we really want is we want to have the, the, the database system trying to manage all this as much as possible, right? We're already managing the execution of transactions. It'd be nice if it, if it can also handle failures and, and, and rollbacks in, in, the, in the chain transaction model. So this is what compensating transactions are. So compensating transactions are a special type of transaction that are written by the application programmer to logically reverse the effects of a, of a transaction that's already committed. And so the key thing to understand here is that, again, these, these are doing logical changes, not physical changes. So if you think about compensating log records from the ARIES recovery protocol, those are doing physical uh, reversals. So I run my transaction the first time, and I create a log record that has the before value and the after value. If I need to now reverse that change, I just flip the, the, the current value with the before value, and that undoes it. Right? That's a physical change, because I'm actually modifying the bits of the values that I've stored to be what they were before I, I, I initially did my update. So now a logical uh, uh, change or logical reversal it has to understand something about how the application is using the database in order to perform this reversal. So the example I always like to give for this is think about a, a, a web application that's keeping track of people that are enrolled in, in the database course here. And there's this counter that keeps track of the number of students that are enrolled. So when I signed up to enroll in the course, the counter was originally nine. And then when I got enrolled, I updated the counter and add, added one to it, so now it's 10. So now if I, for, for like, you know, weird diarrhea reasons or some, some, some other bizarre problem, I need to leave the course, then I want to re reverse that counter. So if I'm doing a physical reversal, a physical compensation, then I would look at the log record that I created the first time I did the update, and I would say, all right, well, I, the old value was, was 9, and I set it to 10, so now let me go back and set it to 9. But the problem here is that, say... 20 other people have signed up for the, for the course after I signed up. So now the counter is actually 30. So if I do a physical reversal, then I'm, the, I'm going to take the counter from 30 and set it to 9, which is incorrect. But if I do a logical reversal, which is just decrement that counter by 1 the same way I incremented it by 1 when I ran the first time, then I'll make sure that I go from 30 to 29, which is what I want. So these compensating transactions are written by the application program and they have to do these sort of logical reversals uh, because only the application programmer can, can, can understand what it means for the database to be put back into correct state after a transaction fails. So now the idea here is that we can then use these compensating transactions in conjunction with chain transactions to now do uh, more complex, larger updates to, uh, to our database. And these are typically what are, what are known as saga transactions. So there's this great paper from Sigma 1997, uh, created by Hector Garcia Molina and Ken Salem. Um, this probably is one of my favorite titles of the paper because it's only five letters, right? Uh, and what they propose for doing how to handle like long running multi step transactions um, entirely inside the database system is to define a sequence of chain transactions and then corresponding compensating transactions that allow you to reverse them. Right, so the way to think about this is that uh, for I'll have n regular transactions and they need to have n minus 1 compensating transactions that know how to undo each of those my first transactions. And the reason why it's n minus 1 because if I get to transaction tn at the very end then I know I, my total transaction is committed and I can undo the change. So again this is going to allow us to support these multi-step, long-running transactions without having the application worry about where they are in, 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 the, in the, the workflow of, of executing transactions that update a lot of this information and making sure we can undo them. So let's look at a really simple example here. So this is what we talked about before of having transactions update a counter, right? So the chain transaction will go from T1 to T2 and then T2 to T3. And along the way, I'm just updating uh, this, this counter by, by one. But let's say now I get to transaction three in my chain, and for whatever reason, this guy aborts. Now, with just regular chain transactions, T1 and T2 would st still remain. But with saga transactions, when I abort this, this, 
for this last transaction, I'm also going to then now go back and invoke compensating transactions to undo the transactions that I actually committed. So in the first case here, I have a compensating transaction for transaction T2, and all this is going to do is do a logical write to decrement the counter uh, that I incremented when I executed the first time. And likewise, same thing for T1, it's just going to decrement that counter. So again, the main idea here is that I could write these compensating transactions myself in my application and worry about invoking them or in, in case of uh, my, ch my chain transaction fails at runtime. But with Saga transactions, the idea is all that logic is now running inside the database system itself, and it knows how to re reverse it as needed. So as far as I know, uh, no database system natively supports uh, uh, chain transactions and uh, Saga transactions. Where you actually see these are in application programming frameworks. Um, they will expose or provide you this API to do these kind of things, and then they, underneath the covers, they just use a database system to, to, to invoke it for you. So, so they sort of make it easier for you as the programmer to implement compensating transactions or saga transactions, and they you don't worry about how to actually manage that yourself. So uh, even though the idea is old with saga transactions, you know, almost over, over 30 years old now, um, it's actually super common now in uh, application programming frameworks for using microservices, right? Because microservices are all about doing these small updates on the small number of records, but maybe you want to do a large update on a lot of different things. So you can use Saga transactions across your microservice fleet to make sure that this is all done atomically and correctly. So I think that's a very interesting idea where like uh, an old concept from the, the you know, literature that, that maybe was not widely adopted when it first came out is actually uh, becoming becoming more prevalent today, um, which I think is pretty cool. All right, so now we can jump and talk about concurrent control. So again, this should all be review for you from 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 your background and your undergraduate da database course. Uh, but a concurrent control protocol is essentially going to be like the traffic cop or coordinator that is going to allow us to execute transactions on a shared database in a multi-programmed way, meaning we're interleaving their operations, but the application programmer doesn't think about these things, doesn't think about the interleaving, they just write their you know, flat transactions with begin the commit and the operations in between. And then the, the control protocol allows the data system to provide the illusion that these transactions are running by themselves on a dedicated system. So you know, this is what the goal of having complex serializable schedules, complex serializable uh, transaction execution, right? We want to essentially have uh, the end state of the database to be equivalent to any serial execution of, of all the transactions that we have to execute, even though we're interleaving their operations. Another way to think about this is that the, the current show protocol is to provide the atomicity and isolation guarantees that we want to have in our, our OLTP database system. So briefly, I want to talk about a little bit how these things are actually implemented. Um, well, again, for today's class, we're just going to go over at a high level to understand the basic types of protocols that exist and what are some of the challenges you have with, with uh, implementing them. The when we see uh, when we start to you know in the context of multi-version current control protocols, we'll see a bit more about where they're actually maintaining the internal transaction state um, as well as the state of the database with latches and locks and other things like that, um, and how that vary based on the implementation. But at a high level, these, these, these concepts are essentially the same, just where they're actually being maintained inside the system can, can vary. The most obvious thing you need for your transaction, you need its current state, like whether it's active, whether it's committed, whether it's aborted, whether it's terminated, and so forth. Then you need to maintain the undo, undo records for any changes you, the transaction makes to the database. And so this is a good difference between the disk-oriented database system and in-memory database system, is that these undo records only need to be stored in an ephemeral data structure inside the system. When a transaction commits, we don't need to write any of these, the undo records out to disk because we have no pages on disk and therefore we don't have to worry about undoing changes from uncommitted transactions. So when a transaction commits, we essentially just blow away the undo log records at some point in time. It may not always be right away. Uh, we blow it away and don't worry about persisting them. The log record we do need to persist though is redo Right, so this is where we're going to, you know, sort of classic protocol, we use writing this out to the Red Head log, 
and then we make sure we flush it when to disk when a transaction commits, and we tell the outside world our transaction is finished because that way the the radio record is, is enough information information for us to to restore the changes that this transaction made to the database. And the last one is going to be the read write set or sometimes also the scan set or index key set for transactions. And we'll see more about this in subsequent lectures. And this, how much information you actually need to maintain per transaction for the read write set uh, depends on the actual implementation of the protocol. So the, there's essentially two categories of uh, control schemes. Two-phase locking, timestamp ordering. And so two-phase locking is considered a pessimistic protocol because it's going to assume that transactions are going to conflict, so therefore it requires them to, to acquire locks on all the days objects before they're allowed to access them. Timestamp ordering protocols are considered optimistic because you assume conflicts are rare, and so you don't require transaction to acquire locks on those database objects, and instead you just check for them at commit time or in some cases you actually as you go along, but in general you want to check for them at the end. Right. You assume there's not going to be any conflicts and you don't worry about it until the very end to see, and you just see whether you were, you, your assumption was correct or not. So I'm going to go through each of these at a, at a high level just so we understand what we're talking about when we talk about the, the, how to actually apply them for multi-version concurrent control because that's mean the main thing we're going to talk about uh, in, in the next week. And we'll talk about what that's actually going on and that we have a sort of common vernacular to describe these various parts. So two-phase locking. Uh, look at a really simple example of a transaction. It wants to do a read on A and a write on B. So before any transaction is allowed to access an object, it has to acquire the locks of them, right? So I need to get a lock on A and a lock on B. Now, one key thing to point out here is I'm not saying whether A and B are tuples, or right? I'm just saying that they're objects in the database. They could be tables, they could be pages, they could be database, databases, right? It could be single attributes within a single tuple. Right? It doesn't matter, the protocol is always the same. So the first phase is when I acquire all my locks, and that's called the growing phase. And then as soon as I release one lock, then I enter what is called now the shrinking phase. And when you're in the shrinking phase, you can only release locks and do operations on the, on the objects you already have locks for. You can't go back and add new locks. And this has been proven if you enforce this shrinking phase uh, uh, guarantee then this will be this is proven to generate complex serializable schedules. All right, so let's look at an example of how the uh, of two transactions running at the same time, two phase locking, and we can see some of the problems that can come up. So my transaction two here, it wants to do a write on B and write on A. So at the very beginning, when both transactions start, they have to acquire locks. So in the case of transaction one, it wants to read A, so it has to acquire a lock on A. And then in, in transaction two, it wants to do a write on B, so it has to acquire a lock on B. Now Again, in the intro class, we, we talked about intention locks, we talked about shared versus exclusive locks. For our purposes here, that doesn't matter. That Those things only provide uh, performance improvements that allow for higher levels of concurrency or to reduce the amount of metadata you have to maintain for transactions. Again, the protocol is always the same no matter uh, whether you, you use those extensions or not. So now with T1, it has a lock on A so it can read it. T2 has a lock on from B so we can write to it. But now we have trouble because we end up here where transaction T1 wants to get the lock on B before it writes to it, but that lock is being held by transaction T2. So therefore it has to stall and wait. And likewise, T, T, transaction T2 wants to get a lock on A, but that's being held by transaction one, which now we have a deadlock and we now we have to resolve this because otherwise these transactions would stall forever. So the variations of the two-phase locking protocols depend on whether doing deadlock detection or deadlock prevention. And with deadlock detection, it essentially means that you allow transactions to acquire locks uh, as, as needed, if they're, if they're able to, meaning nobody else is holding it. Um, and then you have a separate thread run in the background, and every so often they're going to check the, the queues for transactions that are waiting for locks, see whether you have a deadlock. This is typically a cycle and a dependency graph. And then you're going to use some kind of heuristic to decide what transaction you want to kill in order to break that deadlock. Right? So this could be things like what transaction holds the most locks, what transaction is the youngest, the newest, right? It, there's different approaches. No one is better than another for all applications and all workloads, and different database systems do different things. The other approach is deadlock prevention, and this is where uh, you're going to check at the moment a transaction tries to acquire a lock to see whether another transaction already holds that lock, 
And if so, then you make a decision about what you will do. So one is that you could, you could just wait for, and assume the other transaction is going to give that lock up right away and then you can acquire it. Or you can say, I'm never going to get that lock and I also might be in a deadlock, so I'll shoot myself in the head and commit suicide if at least on my locks and reschedule myself and come back. Um, or the last approach is the most gangster one. You basically put a gun to the other transaction's head, shoot it, steal its lock, and run off and keep running. Right? Again, different systems do different things. No one approach is better than another for all applications. Um, you know, in some ways, it's almost a software engineering choice for these. All right, so the next class of protocols are called timestamp ordering. So again, this is where things get confusing. Uh, there's a basic timestamp ordering protocol, which, which again, every textbook covers, which we'll go over right now. Um, and then there's also optimistic country, optimistic country protocol, which is a variant of timestamp ordering. Um, but again, all timestamp ordering protocols are considered optimistic, but there is one implementation of one algorithm specifically called optimistic concurrency control, right? It is what it is. Um, this is going to be a reoccurring theme throughout the entire semester where just the same name is reused for a bunch of different th concepts and a bunch of different things. All right, so with basic timestamp ordering, we're going to check for conflicts on e each read and write, and we're going to use timestamps to figure out whether one transaction is allowed to read something uh, or not, right? Depending on whether somebody else in the future or in the past has, has done something to the thing we're trying to access. In optimistic Hertz code protocol, we're going to store our changes in a private workspace and then just at commit time go see whether there's a conflict. So let's look at the first one. So with basic TO, we have our transaction here. We want to do a write, read on A, write on B, and a write on A. So at the very beginning on the basic timestamp ordering protocol, we need to sign our transaction a timestamp. And this timestamp is then going to be used to, to determine the serial, serial ordering of operations for all our transactions. So let's do a really simple kind of uh, timestamp. We just use a counter. So we have some kind of atomic counter. Every time we, a transaction starts, we just do a uh, compare and swap to add one to it. So our timestamp for this transaction is 10,001. Now in the database, what's going to happen is we're going to maintain for every single tuple, we're going to maintain a read timestamp and a write timestamp. So this, these would be timestamps that correspond to the transactions that last came along and, and did something or accessed the, the tuple. So our transaction starts, wants to do a read on A. So our, we go check in the database, this is the object we want to read, A. Its write timestamp is 10,000. Our, our timestamp is 10,001. So we know whatever transaction uh, that wrote to this object was in the past, and therefore we should be allowed to see its changes because that's what how things would, 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 would happen if we were doing serial order execution. So we do, are able to do our read, and then we update our read timestamp with uh, our timestamp 10,001. Now we do a write on B, same thing. We need to check to see whether anybody has written to the same object we're trying to write to in the future, and therefore our write would overwrite it, and that would be a problem. Um, and we also make sure that nobody in the future has read this object, and therefore has a timestamp that's higher than us, and, but missed our read, which shouldn't happen under a serial execution order. And so in this case here, we're fine, because 10,000 is less than 10,001 for, for both timestamps. So we're allowed to do the write, install the update, and then we update the, the right timestamp with our uh, with our timestamp. So now let's say this transaction goes off and does something does some something else, right? It, it say the disk data system flushes data at the disk and has to stall. Then it goes out in the network and gets some additional information. Whatever it is, it's not running. It's stalled. And then during this time, another transaction comes along and does an update to object A. And this op, this Second transaction has timestamp 10,005, which is in the future from us. And so it's allowed to overwrite our change or overwrite the, the, the current value in A because our transaction read it in the past at timestamp 10,001, and we're writing the future, so that's fine. Because in under serial ordering, it shouldn't see our write anyway. So now when our transaction comes back and resumes execution and tries to do a write on A, now its timestamp is going to be less than the right timestamp of A. So therefore, it has to abort because now it's going to be overriding something uh, that got updated in, in the logical future with data in the in, in the past. So what I'll say is that as far as I know, very few systems actually implement the basic timestamp ordering protocol as I'm describing here. You'll see this again when we talk about multi-version concurrent control. That's when people typically how people typically implement something like this. So now a a more well-known and more sophisticated approach to doing timestamp ordering is called OCC or Optimistic Concurrency Control. 
So think of this as like almost like a multi-version system, but instead of actually having the versions be visible to other transactions, they're only visible to our transaction because we're going to make all of our changes to a private workspace. And only when we go to commit and after we verify that there's no conflicts with any other transactions, then we install the updates from our private workspace into the, the global database. And now our, cha our changes are visible to everyone. So the OCC protocol is old. It, it actually was vented here at CMU going back to uh, 1981 by H.T. Kung, who was not a database professor, but he sort of stumbled upon this protocol. Um, and like I said, it, it, it's been used more recently in the in-memory databases, less so back in the day when it came out for disk-oriented systems. Most disk-oriented systems implement two-phase blocking. All right, so let's look at how OCC works. So we have a transaction that wants to do read on A, write on A, and then write on B. So now in our database, unlike before with basic timestamp ordering protocol, where we had to have both the read timestamp and the write timestamp, with OCC, we only need the write timestamp. So we first start off, and we're going to do a read on A. So unlike basic timestamp ordering protocol, we don't get a timestamp when our transaction starts. Right? At this point, our transaction doesn't really exist, and no one's going to be able to see our changes because we're going to put all our changes into a private workspace. So this first part is called the, the read phase. And again, this is confusing because it's, it's, we're actually going to do writes to our database, but it, for whatever reason, it's called the read phase. So when we do a read, we're going to go to the global database and find the record that we want and then copy it into our private workspace. I'm going to copy along the metadata to say what the write timestamp was uh, when, we, when we brought it in. But now when we do a write, instead of updating the global database, we're going to modify our private workspace. So for this, we need to overwrite our write timestamp, but since our transaction wasn't assigned one yet at the beginning, we'll just set that to affinity and update the value to be whatever it wants to be. Likewise, when we do a write on B, same thing. We copy it from the global workspace into our private workspace. We update the, the value with whatever the new value we want to install, and then we set the write timestamp to be infinity. So now at this point, the transaction is going to ask to commit. Right? The application is going to send you, you know, from the command line or within the program, it's going to say commit my transaction. But now there's a bunch of extra work we have to do before we're allowed to truly commit the transaction to check to see whether there was any conflicts while we, that, you know, that, that occurred while we were running. So there's two additional phases that are going to come out of the read phase. There's going to be the, the, the validate phase and the write phase. So essentially the validate phase is we're going to look at all the changes we made in our private workspace and either look at transactions that have committed before we did or transactions that have not committed yet, right? Whether we're looking backwards or forwards in time, doesn't matter the semantically the same, it's just how you actually want to implement it. We check to see whether there's any conflicts, if yes, then we have to board all our changes, which is easy to do because it's, it's in our private workspace, so we just blow it away. But if we pass the validate phase, then we enter the write phase where we install our, we, we get our timestamp finally, and then we install our changes into the global database with our, with our, with our updated write timestamp. Then now at this point, once all our, our changes are installed, our transaction is fully considered fully committed, and we can tell the outside world that we finished. So again, I, I don't want to go into the details of how you actually implement OCC because we're going to focus on that when we talk about uh, implementing this in the context of, of a multi-version system. So, we'll, so hold on, hold off on that for, for later, you know, because the, the validate phase is sort of the most important part, and that can be quite tricky. All right, so one observation we can make now about these protocols is that. Obviously, the optimistic conventional protocols are going to perform better, the time step ordering protocols are going to perform better when there's low contention because the data system is not going to end up wasting its time checking for conflicts that just don't exist. But the problem, though, is that you know, for, for really important applications, there's often a lot of contention. And what will happen is that the protocols essentially just sort of degenerate into the same... Uh, you know, generating schedules with the same serial execution. So no one, under extreme circumstances, no one protocol is better than another. So the, to understand this better, the paper I had you guys read was a survey paper that I wrote uh, with a PhD student back at MIT uh, on evaluating these, these concurrent protocols in the context of in-memory databases, but looking at them at a sort of really high level of parallelism. 
So what I mean by that is instead of looking at you know a single single machine that maybe has uh, you know, 32, 64 cores, we want to look at really large core counts and see how the protocols actually fare. And we're going to do this in the context of a single deskbed system, so we don't worry about aspects and features of the of the of the, of the database system that may interfere or may taint our measurements. So what I mean, what I mean by this is that rather than taking MySQL, which does you know two-phase locking and and uh, uh, Postgres, which does timestamp ordering, like instead of taking those two systems and running them on uh, and comparing them sort of uh, based on how this system is actually implemented, we actually just want to look at what protocols are using implement in, into a single test system, and that way we strip out all of this additional overhead that don't actually matter to the things that we, we want to measure because we want to focus on just the concurrent protocols. And again, the idea here is that we're going to run these in extreme environments because that's going to allow us to more easily identify what are the bottlenecks in a database system that can prevent these systems from scaling to higher core counts. So the way we're going to do this is run this in a, a CPU simulator called Graphite that was uh, developed at MIT. Um, so the way to think about what Graphite is, is simulating is that it's a single socket tile-based CPU where there is a two-dimensional two mesh network that allows cores to communicate with each other. Um, so think about this as like, you know, when we talk about the Xeons and the QPI, Right, that's a, a NUMA system where you have two CPU sockets and there's a, there's a bus in between the two of them that allows them to communicate, but I can communicate on the cores with the cores at, at, in my socket much more quickly than I can communicate with the cores on the other socket. Right, so that's a NUMA architecture, non-uniform memory access. The CPU we're going to simulate in, for this paper is called NUCA, non-uniform cache access or architecture. And this is where the... Uh, cost of accessing the, the cache is going to be different because there's going to be a groups of cache, there's going to be a, a shared L2 cache for groups of cores, but then again, I need to go over this mesh network to communicate with, with other cores. I can't just talk directly to my neighbors, right, uh, or go over a single bus. i got to figure out how to wrap my messages uh, on the messaging fabric on, on the chip. So the, for the most part, for the rest of the semester, we're, we're actually going to be talking about NUMA architecture the, the non-uniform memory access with uh, things like Xeons. Uh, for this one, because we we're trying to look at really high core counts, I'm not an architecture person, but my understanding from talking to the Intel guys is that when you're looking at a system with a thousand cores, you have to use something that's, that's, that's like what Graphite is using here. The, 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 the interconnect between sockets would, is, is not going to not going to work. So again, we're going to implement we're going to implement these different country protocols in a single system called called DBX1000. So this is a system that, that was explicitly built with this paper to run these experiments inside this chip simulator. Um, because the chip simulator is 10,000 X slower on wall clock time, um, we need to be very, uh, the DBX1000 needs to be very stripped down and not have a, a lot of additional features because that would just take forever to run these experiments. So they actually, the student that wrote DBX1000 actually wrote some core parts of it in assembly because that would end up being way faster than anything you can write in C. Uh, so that was very impressive when he did that. All right, so we're going to implement a bunch of different protocols in, uh, a, single, in a single test by system, and then we're going to evaluate that with the, the YCSB benchmark, the Yahoo Cloud Serving benchmark. So this is a, sort of a, a well-known key value store benchmark that's supposed to simulate the access patterns of online web, web applications. So we're going to have two million tuples, uh, and each tuple is going to be one kilobyte, and in the original YCSB, each transaction only modifies a single tuple. But to make this more realistic, we're going to have each transaction actually modify, uh, read or modify up to 16 tuples. And we're going to vary the amount of skew we have in the transactions access patterns to vary, to, to simulate different types of hotspots and measure how contention affects performance for these transactions. And we're, going to execute, and we're going to execute all these transactions with the serialized well isolation level. So just to understand what the, uh, the, the labels are going to mean in our graph legends. So we're going to group, group our transaction or concurrent protocols into uh, whether, again, two-phase locking or time step ordering. So we have deadlock detection, no wait, and wait and die. No wait basically means that if I go, if I go try to acquire a lock and that lock is not available, I immediately kill myself on abort and rollback. So these deadlock types of deadlock detection approaches are used in, in these types of uh, these major database systems. Um, the second category is timestamp ordering, 
Again, we'll have the basic time signal ordering protocol and the, the optimistic curvature protocol that I discussed. And then we're going to use a multi-version uh, variant of time, the time stamp ordering protocol um, that is really common and, and used in a, in a bunch of these different database systems. So we'll discuss MVCC TO in, in the next couple of classes. Again, the way to think about it is that it's almost like OCC, but you uh, you get a timestamp when you first arrive, and then instead of making changes to a private workspace, you're up updating the global database. All right, so the very first experiment we're going to do is we're going to look at a read-only workload. So this is where you have almost zero contention at the logical lock level um, because there's, you know, transactions are just, they're not making any modifications, they're just reading data. So anybody can read anything without any bottlenecks. So the first trend we see is that deadlock detection and no wait turn out to perform the best here and actually can scale up to a thousand cores um, because they're not really doing any extra work. Right? No wait says I need to acquire this lock, which I can because it's always a shared lock. So therefore I just update a status and say I, I have a shared lock on this tuple and then I can I can read it. I can do that very quickly. With deadlock detection, same thing. I'm acquiring shared locks. There's never any deadlock, so there's never any stalling. So everything uh, runs real quickly. The next trend we see is that for no wait and NPCC, there's this little dip here around 800 cores. So one way to think about it is, I should explain this. So for the, the as we scale along the x-axis for the number of cores, there'll be one additional thread is added to the system, and that one thread is going to be adding, uh, executing a new transaction. So at 800 cores, there's going to be at most 800 simultaneous transactions running at the same time. So we see a dip here at 800 cores, and this is due to the transactions always having to acquire new timestamps for, or to, you know, from the from the system which is going to end up being a bottleneck uh, based on how we actually implement it, which we'll, which we'll discuss in a second. And the last one here is we see OCC actually performs the worst, and this is because the overhead of copying things out of the, 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 the global database um, and into a, actually a private workspace you know, to, to, to apply your changes or to make sure you have repeatable reads, that copying ends up being a bottleneck and the performance gets, gets worse. But now we're going to start adding writes to our workload, and we can increase the amount of contention we have in it. So we'll, by increasing the contention, we're going to mean that uh, a larger portion of, of, the of the transactions are going to access a, a some subset of the database. So I think this one is 60% uh, of the transactions are going to access 20% of the database. So the first thing you see is that the deadlock detection uh, line uh, falls off and dies immediately. It actually does the worst here. Right? And this is because now there's more conflicts. Uh, we're going to spend more time trying to figure out, uh, since, since there's more transactions could try to be accessing the same, the same or updating the same tuples, there's going to be more conflicts, there'll be more deadlocks, and it's going to take longer for the deadlock de detection thread to find those, those transactions, and therefore they're going to be stalled, and, and we're, we're end up wasting work. The uh, no wait and wait and die still actually perform really well. Wait die does, or sorry, no wait does the best here, and this is because these protocols are actually so simple, and the cost of of, of restarting a transaction in this environment in the DBX one thousand system is actually really cheap because everything's running in store procedures. I check to see whether the transaction I want or the, the the lock I need is there. If I can acquire it, I just go ahead and get it. If I can't, then I immediately kill myself. Uh, and rollback, which is a cheap operation because everything's in memory, we didn't log anything to disk, and come back and restart again. So I can keep sort of essentially spinning and doing this over and over again until I acquire the locks that I actually need. We see this middle band here where the time stamp ordering protocol, MVCC and OCC are roughly doing about the same. And again, this is because they're copying data anytime they do, uh, do updates and maintain different versions, um, or they are uh, uh, you know, trying to acquire timestamps from from, from, a, from a global shared counter. So these guys are sort of roughly doing the same, but again, OCC is always doing the worst because it's just it has to copy way more data when you do reads. All right, the last graph is sort of the the, the money shot of all this. This is now we're running again up to a thousand cores with a right intensive workload with high contention. So this is now ninety percent of the transactions are trying to update ten percent of the database. So. What you see is that all the, 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 the protocols essentially uh, flatline and 
converge to zero when you're up to a, almost zero when you're up to a thousand cores. So this, this is what I was saying before, but that when when there's high contention, then the the different protocols essentially uh, uh, degenerate into to performing the same. We do see, however, that no way it's up. It's doing actually do pretty well. It's a champ almost up to 800 transactions a second. Now we're not executing that many transactions, right? We're only executing 200,000 at most transactions a second, which is not a lot compared to what we saw in the previous graphs. But it's doing okay up until this point here uh, at 800 transactions a second, which is, again, uh, now what happens is that there's just so much contention because there's so many active transactions that the the transactions are hitting conflicts because they can't acquire the locks they need, immediately boarding themselves and rolling back. So they're just spinning, doing much of useless work, just starting and restarting, starting and restarting over and over again. So the interesting thing to point out, though, is that when we look at when we have a small number of cores, OCC does the worst. But when we go to 1,000 cores, it actually does the best. And the reason is because uh, when you're at these extreme cases here, OCC is essentially running at in, in serial order. right? So that the, and under the validation protocol, it'll guarantee that at least one transaction will be able to commit. And so it's essentially running this now at serial order. So going back to this, you see that at 1,000 cores, you're essentially getting the same performance you get at like four cores. And that's because we're ex essentially executing one transaction at a time. There's all this other crap we're doing on the other uh, 996 cores of starting and restarting transactions, copying crap that ends up getting thrown away. But in the end, we still can execute be, been able to execute one transaction. So this is a good example of all this wasted work we're doing, having all this, you know, this 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 amazing CPU, uh, but it doesn't actually help us for any of our protocols because of this contention point of, of during the validation phase. So the, the main takeaway I want to get from this is that the circle on the on the on the on the left hand side here, uh, when we have a small number of core counts, this is roughly around where where we where we are today in modern systems. Uh, on, on a single CPU or a single machine. If you go distributed, then that increases your core count, but that now the network becomes this big bottleneck and that, that causes other problems. So there's this big gap in the middle where there, there's currently a lot of active research being done and try to how to resolve this, right? The no weight seems like this be somewhat ideal, but again, the, the number, the absolute number is not that great. And this relies on everything running as store procedures, which we'll see later on. This is not always the case in, in a lot of application scenarios. So this is problematic here. And, and frankly, the there's no good answer of how to solve this. There's no you know piece of hardware that's going to come and save us to solve this problem. I think it's going to be a combination of better algorithms, but also now exposing more information about what the application is trying to do with the data down to the actual database system. So in the sake of time, I'm going to sort of go through this quickly. This is just showing you the, the time is being spent while I execute all of these different transactions. And the yellow bar corresponds to the time wasted spent doing aborts. And again, you see under no weight, it's doing, uh, it's doing well, but it's just it's executing way more aborts than everyone else um, because it's just sort of spinning and trying to start and restart transactions over again. Same thing with OCC. It does a little bit better. Or, uh, it has a little bit less aborts. Uh, but it's spending more time in the transaction manager because it has to copy data. So again, this is just showing you that it's uh, the main bottleneck is, is because we have to port transactions because there's conflicts, not essentially anything about, about the protocol itself. So we can actually look a little bit deeper now what are all the different bottlenecks we can have, right? So break it up into three categories, lock thrashing, time step allocation, and mem memory allocations. So these are fundamental to the implementation of the, of the system and not something directly applicable to you know, a single protocol. So with lock thrashing, the idea is that um, as a transaction has to wait longer to acquire locks because there's contention, then if I have to wait longer to acquire my locks and you're waiting for, for, for me to release my locks, then you're gonna end up waiting longer too. So there's this convoy of effect where one transaction waits longer that causes another transaction to wait longer and so forth, and it ripples up down the rot down the line. And at some point, there's a tipping point where we end up doing worse than we would have uh, uh, executing with, with a lower number of core counts than we would with higher number of core counts. So one way we can actually measure this phenomenon 
in our system is actually have our transactions acquire locks in primary key order. So this means that say I have locks A, B, C, and D. So I want to so anybody who wants to acquire a lock on on A and B has to acquire A first before B, and you know B before C and C before D. And what happens if you if you enforce this, which you can't do in a real system, but this allows you to uh, uh, ensure that there's never any deadlocks, and that you're really only waiting for the transaction in front of you to release its locks, right? and it's not waiting for you. And so if you do this in the simulator, you end up with these nice curves like this. Uh, and so theta is very the, the, the parameter theta is varying the amount of skew in the system. So if theta is 0 0.8, that's the most skew. Theta 0 is no skew. So what you see is that these two dips in the scalability of the system as you increase the number of cores, where now you have lock thrashing, right? Because this is where the transactions are waiting longer to acquire locks held by other transactions, and transactions behind them are waiting longer, and then you see you see this 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 knee and this dip. What's really cool about this, like this graph, when, when we did this in the experiment, is that this is exactly what you see in like theory when you go look at like the textbook and you go look at lock thrashing. They'll usually show like a hand drawn graph that looks like this uh, to to explain the effect. And but here's here's an example in a in a real testbed system that exhibits exactly exactly this problem. The next issue we're going to have is actually how to like, allocate timestamps. So we saw this uh, when we talked about timestamp ordering. Um, where the as you increase the core count, now all your transactions are trying to acquire uh, a timestamp from a single global global shared resource, and that ends up becoming a bottleneck. So I don't want to talk too much about this right now, but this is going to come up multiple times throughout the semester about how we actually do uh, efficient resource uh, sharing or having critical sections where multiple threads may be trying to read or write some, to something, some piece of memory, and how can we do this efficiently without having everyone uh, get bottlenecked on, on that, that critical section. So the worst way to do a timestamp is you use a mutex. I'll explain more about this later on, um, but this goes into the operating system with a syscall in the worst case scenario, and this is always just gonna be super slow. The next way to get a little better is to do atomic addition, and this is a single instruction to do a compare and swap to uh, you know, update the value and, and, get, and check to see whether you actually you update it or not and get a new timestamp that way. The reason why this is going to be problematic in a thousand core CPU is that it's going to require a cache invalidation every time you do an update, which if every transaction is trying to get a single counter, then that's going to update, have to invalidate everyone and that's going to be slow. So another way to get around this is to do batch atomic addition. So this is where you, instead of getting a single timestamp at a time, maybe for a group of threads you get 10 timestamps and then you hand them out locally and only go back to the global counter anytime you need to get uh, uh, a new you know a new batch of timestamps so this is a pretty good idea we'll see this multiple times again throughout the semester you just need to make sure that if uh, transactions are aborting because of their timestamps in the batch is less than some other transaction that's updating a bunch of stuff that you have a way to avoid just burning through your timestamps very quickly and, and essentially Degenerating into the single, you know, single up uh, time step at a time approach. The other things I talked about in the paper were doing hardware clocks and hardware counters. Again, I don't, I don't want to talk about too much about this, but the, other than to say, if the CPU can provide us with, you know, fast instructions that do essentially the technique or the a, a provide us the primitive that we're implementing in software, then this would be ideal for us because then we just you know single instructions and let the hardware handle all this for us. So this graph is just showing you. The, the drop off rate uh, or the, as you scale up to really high number of times per second for, for a thousand cores, what the, uh, you know, where these different approaches, uh, how these different approaches uh, fare with each other. All right, the last thing that I'll talk about, and this will come up again multiple times throughout the semester, is that anytime we gotta read and write data, anytime we gotta copy anything, that sucks. That's gonna be slow. So, because we may have to end up allocating memory, which means that we may have to make a call to malloc. And if we're using the, the default libc malloc implementation you get from Linux, uh, that's gonna be terrible, that's gonna be slow. So we need to be more careful about how we use memory um, but, and keep track of where the memory is located so that we read memory that's close to us um, rather than something that's far away on another socket. There's a whole bunch of crap we're gonna have to worry about when we start worrying, you know, worrying about where we actually read and writing memory to. Um, 
but we'll, we'll cover that later on when we talk about storage. The main takeaway from this is like uh, the libc malloc is super slow. We want to use G JE malloc or TC malloc. And in our own system, we use, we use JE malloc. And it's much, much better. All right, so to finish up, I want to quickly talk about isolation levels. So in the thousand core paper, the Staring of the Abyss paper, the, all the transactions are running at serialized isolation level. And this is because uh, serializability within you know, the database academia is considered the gold standard of how we want to provide transactions to programmers. Um, the tricky thing, though, is that we enforcing serializability in a database system may end up minimizing or reducing the amount of concurrency we actually can have, and therefore you end up with really shitty performance. Um, and so, in actuality, in most systems, we'll see in a second, most systems don't actually by default support serializability or, or provide serializability. They're going to run at what is called a, a weaker isolation level. Um, and we're going to do this for performance reasons or engineering reasons because it's going to allow us to have, get better scalability because we don't have to worry about finding complex serializable execution or complex serializable interleavings for our transactions. So an isolation level is a way to con control uh, on the, the extent to which a transaction will be could incur different anomalies from other transactions running at the same time, right? So the, the weaker the isolation that you have, the more exposure your transaction could possibly have to uh, these different anomalies. So you have dirty reads, unrepeatable reads, and phantom reads. Now these are what you get from the sort of the, the textbook definition of, of isolation levels. But we'll see that we different type of anomalies you can have. There's way more than this, um, but there's two we want to focus on beyond these. So the ANSI standard defines the four isolation levels of serializable, repeatable reads, and recommitted, read uncommitted. So the way to think about this is going from the top to the bottom, serializable will guarantee that you have no phantoms, all repeatable reads, and nerdy reads. So this is like, again, this is generating execution schedules from transactions that are equivalent to a complex serializable schedule. But in repeatable reads, we may have phantoms with recommitted, we can have phantoms and unrepeatable reads, and read uncommitted, all bets are off, and, all the possible anomalies could possibly have. So you can map it sort of like a hierarchy like this. Again, the bottom is the weakest, the top is the, the most strict or the, uh, the, the most protective. And again, the key, key thing to point about these anomalies is, is that it's not that any transaction is going to, is always going to hit these anomalies when they run at a lower isolation level. It's just the database system is not gonna guarantee that you won't. So if you only execute one transaction at, at a time, in serial order in your application, because you know your website doesn't get any traffic, then you're going to run at serializable isolation level already because there's no concurrent transactions, so therefore you can have no anomalies, right? So again, these it's not necessarily mean that if you're running at a low isolation level that you're going to hit these problems. It's just that data system won't protect you. So this is why the in real world systems, most of them don't by default run with uh, serializable isolation level. They actually run with read committed. And then the maximum isolation level that a lot of these systems support is actually, in some cases, not even uh, 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 serializable at all. So in these examples here, you actually do get serializable, but there's a bunch of other ones where maybe the most they go is read committed, read committed or repeatable read. So again, we covered these in the intro class. I don't want to spend too much time talking about them in further detail, but I do want to focus on these two other isolation levels that don't fit into the ANSI standard that I just talked about, cursor stability and snatch isolation. So the ANSI isolation levels were part of the SQL 92 standard, and the standards body that developed them defined these anomalies in the context of a two-phase locking database minute system. But this is a great paper from 1995 written by you know, some very famous database researchers that basically said, look, yes, what you're describing exists for two-phase locking systems, but for time stable ordering systems and optimistic systems, this is actually not, this doesn't cover everything. And even within actually two-phase locking systems, there's other problems that can occur that two-phase locking doesn't, doesn't, or other anomalies that can occur that two-phase locking doesn't actually protect from as you define it, as, as you, as when you enforce the different isolation levels defined in the standard. So I want to go through each of these one by one. The focus is going to be on snapshot isolation because that's what we're gonna get. That's what we're gonna, what we're gonna get when we do multi-versioning, and that really is gonna be the focus on 
uh, through the most of the semester because that's how pe most people think about executing analytical queries. So you want to, you know, a snapshot of the database, and you don't worry maybe worry about seeing new updates. You just want to say, here's my consistent snapshot, run my query on, on that. So with cursor stability, the idea is that the the database system as it executes a transaction can maintain a, a cursor lock on whatever object that the, the, the transaction is, is operating on, and it does not release that lock until it moves on to the next item. So the way to think about this is that it's going to be a slightly stronger isolation level that sits in between repeatable reads and read committed that is going to prevent what is called the loss update anomaly, right? So this is not the same thing as two-phase locking because you're not acquiring locks in the growing phase, or at least in the shrinking phase. Think of this as like you know, the two-phase locking, the shrinking, growing phase is within the context of the entire transaction. This cursor stability stuff that I'm talking about, the cursor lock, is on for like a single query, right? Or a single two, you know, multiple queries that operate on the same object. But as soon as I move on to another object, I release that lock. But I can only hold one cursor lock at a time, so therefore there can't be any, any deadlocks. All right, so let's, let's take an example of what the loss update anomaly looks like. So I have two transactions, T1, T2. T1 wants to do a read on A, and then T2 will, would start and do a write on A. T1 comes back and does a write on A. So again, I start here, I do my read, that's fine. Uh, now I do my write on A in transaction T2. But now I come back and do a write on A in T1, and then I commit. But now when I commit T, T2, it's going to end up losing the modification it made to object A, even though it commits after T1. And right, this is this, this is considered a loss update. So a cursor lock on A held by T1 would solve this problem because they would hold that lock on the read on A, then it would stall for whatever reason, but then T2 wouldn't allow to be allowed to modify A because it couldn't get the cursor lock on that object. And then T1 resumes and then can, can do the write on A. And then if it goes off and writes another object, uh, reads and writes to another object, it, gets, it releases that cursor lock on A and gets the new cursor lock. Or if it commits, it releases the cursor lock. And then T2 can then do its update. So we, we would avoid this problem. So not very many systems uh, support cursor stability as an isolation level. Uh, you get it by default in DB2. Um, I'm actually not aware of any other system that actually does this. Now, some systems will, will use cursor locks to avoid this problem, but the, uh, the whether you can declare it specifically, I, I, I only think DB2 allow, can, allows you to do that. I, the, the, the second isolation level I want to focus on more is, is SAMHSA isolation. And so this one's pretty easy to understand. And it's just that when a transaction starts, the, the, the data is we guarantee is that any reads that, that transaction makes will be based on a consistent snapshot that existed at the time that that transaction started. So that means that there's another there's an active transaction that is running when our transaction starts, and say that first active transaction has modified you know, the database in some ways, our new transaction doesn't see any of those changes because that transaction did not commit before our transaction started. So it wouldn't be part of a consistent snapshot. So now what, if I would do modifications in to our, on our snapshot isolation, our trans as long as our transaction, all along the, the modifications we made to the database do not conflict with any other modifications made by any other transactions that have, that have occurred since we created our snapshot, then we're allowed to commit because that still will be conflict serializable, right? But the tricky thing, though, is now if I read stuff in my snapshot that then gets modified by another transaction, I don't see those updates because those updates uh, were not part of my consistent snapshot. So this is what is called the right skew anomaly. Again, the loss update anomaly and right skew anomaly are different types of anomalies that exist uh, but aren't part of the ANSI standard when we'll be able to talk about anomalies in, 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 in SQL, you know, recommitted, read committed repeatable reads and serializable. So I always, the way to understand right, the right skew anomaly is to use this really great example that was uh, invented by Jim Gray um, using a database of marbles. 
right? Think of like, you know, little glass marbles, like you, you shoot them, right? Little think pebbles. And pebbles, these pebbles in this database can have two colors. They can be black or white. So we're going to have two transactions run at the exact same time under snapshot isolation, and we can see how, why this thing is not serializable because, because of this fright skew anomaly. So transaction one is going to change any white marbles that exist in the database to black. And transaction two, it's going to change any black marbles that exist in the database to white. So both these transactions start. They both have the same consistent snapshot. And in the case of uh, transaction T1, it's going to see these two white pebbles or marbles. Transaction T2 is going to see these two black pebbles or marbles. And therefore, they're going to flip the colors. And then now when they go to commit and write their changes to the database, the write set for transaction one at the top only contains the, the bottom two marbles and it, and it flipped them to black. The transaction at the bottom, only, its write set only contains the, the, the top two marbles that it flipped to white. Therefore, the write set to these two, these two transactions don't conflict and therefore they're both allowed to commit and we can start the updates. But now we end up at the state of the database where essentially we, we, the, all the black marbles went white and all the black marbles uh, uh, all black marbles went white and all the white marbles went black based on a, on a consistent snapshot. And this is not serializable because if it was truly a serializable execution, we would execute T1 first, put all the marbles to black, and then execute T2 and put all the marbles to white. So under snapshot isolation, I, I was able to uh, generate a state of the database with, that is not equivalent to something like this. So you need all the marbles have to be white, all the marbles have to be black. So this is why, uh, uh, again, snapshot isolation is not considered full serializable. So we go back to our hierarchy. It's actually a bit more complicated than before, right? So we have cross stability in between recommitted and repeatable reads. And then snapshot isolation is this other weird thing on the side too, where uh, the repeatable reads it doesn't suffer from, from this problem, but it, it, you know, it, this right skew anomaly occurs in snapshot isolation and it can't actually uh, resolve it. So again, we're going to focus on snapshot isolation. We're going to see how to actually make it serializable uh, in Postgres and other systems uh, in the next couple classes. But I'll just say that uh, this problem of isolation levels is even more complicated than this. I'm only showing you uh, uh, six of them here. Uh, there's this PhD dissertation from the late 1990s from Atul Aditya at MIT. And he maps out what was known at the time for the entire space of, of different isolation levels and all these different types of anomalies that you that you can have, uh, there's been a lot of great work in the last done in the last five or six years expanding this 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 flowchart even further. But you know, for our purposes, we don't care about. It. We're going to focus on snapshot isolation. But it's just showing you that there's the isolation levels will you get, by lowering the isolation level below it's serializable, it'll expose potentially your transaction to more anomalies. And there's all these other things you can actually be exposed to as well. They're not, not captured in the sort of the three basic anomaly types that we talked about before. All right, so I realized I went super long on this, but there's just so much transaction I wanted to talk about. I, I, if it's not clear, again, I realize I'm hanging out in this weird shed and I'm, I'm talking to you without a classroom, but, and you can't see how excited I am. Transactions are awesome. Transactions are hard. They're hard to get implement correctly. They're hard to implement uh, efficiently. Um, but there's so many weird aspects of them or cool aspects of them that we need, we need to think about as we build out a real database window system. And I'll, all I did today was just talk about how to update objects in the database, like, you know, abstract objects that don't really, uh, you know, that aren't tuples, that aren't records, that aren't, aren't, aren't databases. When we start focusing on real concursional implementations and we start throwing in all these additional components we need in a real database window system to be able to support transactions and queries efficiently, indexes, triggers, catalogs, and sequences, materialized views, and so forth. When we start bringing all that crap in, that's when things get really hard because now we need to reason about the state, not only the state of the database objects that we're modifying, but also the, the how it's going to find this data if it tries to read these auxiliary data structures. So again, hopefully, you, you know, my energy is coming through uh, the lecture, but this is something we're going to cover throughout the entire semester um, of how to actually do all the crap we're talking about in the constant transaction, which I think is really cool. All right, so to finish up the, uh, the, the next class, we're going to talk about multi-version control. And this is going to be a three-part lecture. We're going to go into details about how to actually implement the control protocol for it, how to do garbage collection, how to do version stores, how to maintain indexes, 
all the things again you need to have when you build a real database system that's doing in-memory MPCC. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm heading out. Uh, the only thing in this town I think is like a Denny's or some bullshit like that. So um, like I said, I'm flying back uh, from the West Coast this weekend, and I'll be on campus starting on on Tuesday next week. So all right, guys, take it easy. See ya. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll my head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man to get a can of St. Isles.